Hey, visionaries, you are now tuned in to the Starts With A Vision podcast, where everything you do in life starts with a vision. If your vision is clear or foggy, you are in the right place. It's time to go take what's yours, because there's a vision only you can see, and a dream only you can dream. And now, your host, Mr. Starts With A Vision. What's going on, guys? It's Mr. Starts with a Vision. And let me say thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Because you could be anywhere else in the world, man. But you're listening. And I'm not about to waste your time. Today's episode is fire, it's flames, it's amazing, it's dope. It's with Alex Sharfin. Let me tell you something. This episode is completely out the box. This episode and interview and conversation is completely different. And when I tell you it's so many nuggets and just different perspective in this show, it really is. So the thing about it is I need you to listen to this thing in its entirety. You know, whenever I say that, you know, it's going to be some heat, some heat rocks. So listen to this podcast episode with Alex Sharfin. He's an entrepreneur, but he helps people grow and scale their business in a completely different way, a way that nobody really talks about, nobody really thinks about. And his whole perspective on things is just completely different. And he is absolutely obsessed with entrepreneurship, being different, changing the world, being a game changer and everything else. So Alex Sharfin is today's guest. Enjoy the episode. What's going on, everybody? What's going on, everybody? It is Mr. Starts With a Vision of the Starts With a Vision podcast. And you already know we have an amazing guest today. We have somebody who's going to give you so much knowledge, and we're going to be talking about the internet, scaling your business, growing your business as an entrepreneur. So I thank you guys for joining us. I thank you so much because you know gratitude is very, very important to me. So Alex Sharfin is our guest. And Alex, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Isaiah. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Like I was saying, somebody who was listening actually uh, put put me on game about you and I checked you out and I liked what you were doing and I know that you haven't been doing this for a few days. You you know, you're a vet in the game. I've been around for a while. I I think you just called me old, by the way, but that's okay. That's okay. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) A vet vet is somebody who knows what the hell they're doing (laughs) and talking about. Yeah, I've been around. (laughs) <laughs> How long have you been around um, entrepreneuring and also on the internet? Um, well, you know, I, I, when I was a young kid, I, I was always an entrepreneur. Uh-huh. I was one of those kids who started businesses from a, from a very young age. Uh-huh. And uh, I had my first, like I sold candy when I was in junior high. I started working with my dad when I was eight. I had a company in college, a financial company that we sold. And um I ended up becoming a consultant at 21. So I've, I've always been an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. As far as being online, you know, I, I, when you say, you know, these days when people say on the internet, they, they assume like online marketing. Mm-hmm. I owned a consultancy in the 90s that uh, was online. We were, in fact, one of the first companies of our kind that ever got online. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it wasn't an online marketing company. I worked with Fortune 500 and blue chip companies. We helped them expand divisions and uh, and take over territories, going to Latin America um, and the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I've been working online in some way almost all of my career. The financial company that we started that I started in college was actually an online financial services company, one of the first billing and collections company that had automated billing. Mm-hmm. And so. Um, the internet has been a part of almost everything I've ever done, but as a information products marketer, the first product we ever released was in 2008. Mm-hmm. And was that what we were talking about earlier? Yeah, I was a certified distressed property expert. We, um, you know, in, in 2007, um, my wife and I lost everything, mm-hmm. uh, we were in South Florida. I had sold my, a few years earlier, I had sold my consultancy. We started a pretty large real estate company. I retired for about three weeks. It did not work out. <laughs> it was brutal. Um, really, it sucked. I almost went crazy. Uh-huh. And like it was three of the loudest weeks in my life, if that makes sense. Uh-huh. And uh, we started a real estate firm. And in early, like 2002, I sold most of my company. And we started this company, grew it like crazy. We were like 
almost retired. We had what we needed. You know, we, we thought we were done. Uh-huh. And then the real estate market crashed and we lost everything. Okay. And I wrote a product to help real estate agents work with homeowners in foreclosure. Uh-huh. And we were bankrupt when we, when we launched that product. Um, it ended up doing phenomenally well. We did about $75 million in that one um, course called the Certified Distressed Property Expert. Mm-hmm. We trained uh, 49,000, or we sold 49,500 and some units. Mm-hmm. 47,000 people finished the course, so our our adoption rate was unheard of. It was over 90%. Mm-hmm. And about 22,000 of them went through a $99 continuity product that still exists today. People are still paying us on that. Mm-hmm. And... Um, that was my, my first foray into information products marketing. And then in 2011, we started coaching business owners on how to grow and scale mm-hmm. and how to put the right systems into their businesses, but not not traditional business systems because most of them are broken. They don't work. And so um, since 2011, we've been showing people how to grow a business online. Okay. Okay. So you said a lot of stuff in there. Huh? Yeah. Too so, much. What'd you say? I, not we're not a marketing coaching company. We are a growth and scale coaching company. I think pretty much everybody coaches marketing in some way, mm-hmm. and we don't. You know, we we work with with entrepreneurs for the most part in our higher end programs who have figured out how to create a customer, who have figured out how to grow a business, who have big opportunity and they want to build the team, build the leverage, mm-hmm. build the systems around them to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. And then in our Momentum Masterclass, we coach, I, I help entrepreneurs optimize and create focus and understand their highest and best use and unleash their entrepreneur skills. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we're kind of in two places. We help entrepreneurs optimize and then we help them grow and scale businesses. But it's interesting at the high end level where I work with people that have million dollar plus companies, mm-hmm. we start with optimizing the entrepreneur. Mm. Okay. And when you say optimizing the entrepreneur, what exactly do you mean? Um, well, I'll ask you a question. Isaiah, how old were you when you uh, when that switch turned on that you just couldn't turn off anymore? Um, I was 22. How old are you now? 27. So do you remember the feeling of like wanting to get everything done, wanting to get more done, wanting to do more, like feeling like you weren't doing enough? Uh, yes. <laughs> and do you remember the feeling of like pushing yourself to the utter limit sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. And it feels like, I'll be real with you, it feels like um, you, you don't really know what's next. You're burned out in a sense mentally. Um, you can't really think of too many more ideas and you just want to break. You just want what you've been working for to pan out. Yeah. Yeah, that's why that's why I help entrepreneurs optimize because we're different than the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. We push ourselves harder. We can't turn it off. We have that engine in the back of our head that says you have to keep going. You have to do more. You have to. And, you know, you feel that. And what I do is I help entrepreneurs physiologically, chemically, cognitively support that because we're different. Like how old were you when you knew you were different than everybody around you? Um, It was it was in high school, honestly. Um, so a little bit older. Yeah, yeah. it was it was in high school, maybe a little bit um, between middle school and high school time frame. Do you I, remember the feeling of like, dude, maybe I'm not like everybody else. But society kind of makes you feel a little bit like, you know, it's different or you should be like everybody else. And that's where that conflict comes from. No doubt. Well, I think the conflict comes from another place. Can I share? Is that cool? A hundred percent. So see, I think there's four types of people in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll let you self-qualify which one you are. Okay. So the first population of people in the world, and, and, and this goes, you know, I, I'll give you a little backstory. I'm an obsessive researcher. Mm-hmm. Like you can probably see in my office here, I'm surrounded by bookshelves. I'm not like Ty Lopez minor in the house. Cause I use them all the time. <laughs> uh, I don't want to have to walk out to the garage. Right. And, uh, so I, I read obsessively. Like I've, I've read hundreds of books on self-performance, self-development. I've, I've read thousands of biographies, mm-hmm. um, tens of thousands of life histories, biographies, third-party accounts of successful people. I wanted to see what made people successful. Mm. And in all of that research, you start to see patterns with successful people. But here's what you also see. We're fundamentally different than the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. And if you only have limited exposure to success, it looks like every person did it differently. But when you start really looking at a big population of successful people, you see patterns. You see the same 
things over and over again. You see the same ways of looking at the world over and over again. And you start realizing that that the rest of the world is different. So the first group out there, the the first evolutionary group of people, and and you know I've I've, I've studied everything from um, psychology to psychiatry to archaeology to um, evolutionary human beings to how how did we evolve? How do we think? What are the chemical reactions in the body? Um, you know I have a lot of clients that are MDs and PhDs, mm-hmm. but they come to me to understand how to optimize because. Um, I've taken a different route at understanding human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the world in general, the biggest population is the people who like to take care of other people. Mm. And here's what's interesting, Isaiah. A lot of entrepreneurs like you, they'll initially think, oh, I think I'm one of those people because I really like to help other people. Mm -hmm. I bet that's true with you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been a crutch. Yeah. You like to help other people. Yeah. Okay. It's a gift and a curse. I I, Exactly. (laughs) But I can disqualify you from the caretaker group. I call this big group the caretakers with one question. Isaiah, do you like to change bedpans? Oh, no. I don't have time to babysit. Okay. See how you just said that? Like it was super matter of fact. Like, like, dude, why are you even asking me that? Right. Here's the fact. There's people out there that if you say, hey, do you like to change bedpans? Dude, I've asked. And, and they'll look you straight in the face and congruently say, if that person needed a bedpan change and I was there to change the bedpan, I feel fulfilled. I, I honored who I am. You know, I mean, that I was of service. Wow. And I'm like, holy shit, I wish I wrote a check. <laughs> right? Right. So are you that group? No. Nah. No. Nah. Okay. Nah. So second group. Second group is it slightly smaller. Mm-hmm. Wait, wait. Let me ask you a question about the caretakers. Can you see how our evolutionary tribe needed those people around? Say that one more time for me. And you see how our evolutionary human tribe uh-huh. needed to have the caretakers around? A hundred percent. Because we had to have – because you and I weren't doing it. Right. We needed that big population uh-huh. whose focus was taking care of other people. Right. So the second group, I called the, the, them the communicators. Uh-huh. Now, these are the people who like to talk a lot. Uh-huh. Now, Isaiah, I can disqualify you from this group with one question. Do you enjoy small talk? No, no, and I will say that not because you're asking me, but I, I despise small talk. Right, because when somebody says, "Hey Isaiah, what did you think about the weather out there?" I don't. What do you really? I don't give a fuck. Right. <laughs> you, somebody says, "Alex, wasn't it hot outside today?" I'm like, "Are you fucking kidding me? We're in an air conditioned environment. Why are we talking about what's outside? Are we going to get something done? Why are you wasting my time?" Right. Like weather is no longer a relevant conversation, but communicators will talk about the weather. They'll talk about the game. They'll talk about a TV show. I've seen two communicators stand at a water fountain or a water cooler and talk about a half hour TV show for 45 minutes. How the fuck does that work? Whoa. You know what I'm talking about. Whoa. Yeah. Talk about a half hour TV show for 45 minutes. You know what I'm talking about? Right. But somebody like us is like, I can't even take listening to him, much less having the conversation. Right. So you're not a communicator. Uh Uh-huh. But our evolutionary tribe of human beings needed the communicators because we need somebody to say, there's a woolly mammoth over there. There's a cliff over there. Don't eat this thing. It'll kill you. We needed them, Mm -hmm. right? So the third group of people – now, if we're going to have conflict, it's usually one of these people. And I I mean I could disqualify you in a heartbeat, but I'm going to ask you the question anyway. But the group is the coordinators. Mm -hmm. And coordinators are the people who like – they like fine print. They like contracts, not because there's a deal, but because there's a contract. And here's how I can disqualify you. Isaiah, how many committees have you volunteered to be on in your lifetime? Uh, I don't probably, I don't know. Maybe one because I was, uh, you know, maybe pressured into it, but I've, I've, commi- I've commitment issues. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. You don't, <laughs> you don't have commission commitment issues. You have committee issues because people like us know that a committee is about the most ineffective way to get something done. However, when you look at coordinators, they live for committees. Mm-hmm. I mean, shit. They have committees that organize committees that organize committees. They want to sit on the committee that manages the other committees. And like, mm-hmm. fuck for people like us, we don't want any of that noise. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not a fake. They're just talking. Like, let's get some real shit done. Dude, it's like politics, right? Like right. who has time for it? Because you know that it's just the same argument 10 years later. Right. And so people like us do not get on committees. So we have these three parts of the human tribe. We have the communicators, the coordinators, and then the the caretakers. So 
evolutionarily, we have the people who take care of other people, the people who carry on oral tradition, and the people who keep things organized. They understand the seasons. They tell us what day of the week it is. They tell us when to plant the seeds. Uh So what is the human tribe missing? The hunters. That's right. Yeah. See, how do I know that? Don't guess that. The hunters. You and I are the evolutionary hunters. And you know you've been hunting your whole life. Right. And the fact is... That when you look at the human society in general, we have human species in general, we have this small population of people Uh who get up every day, go into the future, create a new reality, come back to the present and then demand it become the reality, demand it becomes real Uh, for the future. Yeah. I mean, don't you spend most of your time in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about like, let's look at the coordinator, the communicator, the caretaker. They live for the present. Like literally, they cling to the status quo. They strive for average. They want to be like everybody else. Why? Because if you're coordinating, caretaking, or communicating, you're doing it all in the present. Mm -hmm. And we, the evolutionary hunters, are the small subset of the population that throughout history has kept this tribe alive. Mm -hmm. And we're the ones who get up and will expose ourselves to the vulnerability and the the pressure and the criticism of saying, hey, I'm going to do something different. Because the fact is, when you say, you know, you go on Facebook and say, hey, I got a job, 200 people congratulate you. Mm-hmm. You go on Facebook and say, I'm starting a business. Your mom says, are you OK? Because people don't understand people like us. Right. And it's because they focus on the present. They want things to stay the same. And we are that subset that says, what can we change? What can we make better? How can we make this like a better place for everybody? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, that's amazing. And it's so, so, so true because when you look at it, and I, I think it, it's mind blowing because we're in 2017 and you would think that more people would catch on to this whole like starting a business thing, right? But people still are living in, not even the present, they're living in the past. Like, oh, Isaiah, that's how it is. With You look at most coordinators, uh-huh. their lives revolve around the past, like bibliographies and footnotes and all the shit that's happened in the past. Right. You know, the coordinators will go backwards to try and go forward. Mm-hmm. Entrepreneurs are like, screw what's happened in the past. I got enough information. I'm going to jump off the cliff. Literally. Why? Why? Because we had to be hardwired. Uh-huh. You know, we go back 2,000 years ago, and you have to get up in the morning grab your loincloth and a rock and go kill a woolly mammoth, uh-huh. you got to be hardwired different than the rest of the world. Dang. And when you get up and you have, like, you know and I know that you can't turn it off. No. Can the rest of the world turn it off? Fucking A, right they can. It, you know, around 7 o'clock every night, there's a show like Wheel of Fortune that plays in the United States. <laughs> right. And it, if they don't play Wheel of Fortune, uh-huh. hundreds of thousands of people call the TV station and say, where's my Wheel of Fortune? Can you imagine ever doing that? No. But people who live in the present, people who live for the day, right. that's how they are. And that's why they don't understand entrepreneurs like you and I. That's why they call us risk takers and and arrogant and you know conceited and aggressive and all the things that we get labeled as. Uh-huh. Every entrepreneur guy has been called an asshole. Every entrepreneur woman has been called a bitch. And the reason is we're driven to change things, not because we want to be an asshole or a bitch, but because that's our personality type. Right, right. And that's just that. Where do you think the hard wiring comes from before we are – you know, publicly that like, do you think you're born an entrepreneur or do you think like you're, you're created an entrepreneur or molded an entrepreneur? You know, um, I get asked that question all the time Mm -hmm. and I know that my kids were born entrepreneurs because Mm -hmm. ever since they were little, they've asked, you know, how do we do more? How do we do different? How do we create stuff? And so I know that, that they were different, but then I look at someone like you who had your awakening, you know, around junior high, high school. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, who knows, maybe prior to that, you were headed down the route of being a coordinator, a communicator, you know, maybe, maybe even a caretaker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have this awakening that turns on the hunter's engine and then you can't stop hunting. Right, right. And and I say, you know, this is real. Like my, you know, my, the, the book that I wrote is called the entrepreneurial personality type. Mm -hmm. And, and the way that I, I, I discovered this personality type is by reading about thousands of successful people. And you see these clear similarities in how we think in how we act and how we do what we do, but the rest of the world doesn't see them because they see people like us as fundamentally broken, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. ADD, ADHD, bipolar, depressed, manic, all this other shit that they figured out how to label us, Asperger's, autistic, whatever it is, 
And by the way, I've been labeled half of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that we re what we really are is we're different than the rest of the population. We're a tiny minority that throughout history got up in the morning and went out to kill something. We put on our lives on the line every day. So when somebody calls an entrepreneur a risk taker today because they start a business, we look at them and we're like, what risk? Right. This is how I live. This is who I am. This is how I eat. Right. Right. And, and, and you know that every time you've gone out and tried to achieve a goal as you approach the finish line. It loses importance to you. Why? Here's why. Yo. Here's why. <laughs> the reason that as and you know it's fucking frustrating too because you're like, yeah, man. Okay, I need to start something new. Well, you have to because we're hunters, and it's not about the kill; it's about the hunt. Right. We are hardwired to keep the human species alive. Right. When you look at a baby human being and you put them in a crib with a baby, any other animal in the world, mm -hmm. about ninety percent of the time, the human being's gonna die. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we had to have something going on that kept our species alive in a very dangerous world with a hostile environment with animals that want to eat us. Damn. And the way we did that is evolutionary hunters were programmed to get up every day and achieve the goal again. Get up every day and go on the hunt. And you know and I know that the only time you don't feel right in the world is when you're not hunting. Yes. That's very real, very real. And um, it's funny because looking at these different, you know, personality types that you were saying or the, the classifications, um, I've never been a coordinator. I've never been a communicator and I've never been a caretaker. But I just didn't know that I was a hunter. Yeah. But I had that spirit. So now looking back, I was born this way, but I just didn't realize it until about 13-ish, because I was in middle school, 7th uh, and 8th grade, and I was selling uh, candy. I would <laughs> ride my bike up to the 99 cent store, and I would get a whole bunch of candy. My grandma gave me like $20. I got $10 worth, and I would sell it, and I made like $20, and I would take $20, you know, and I would just build on that. So I, I was that very way. well. <laughs> you know? So that's, that's good stuff right there. So let me ask you this now. So you saying that um, as entrepreneurs, we can't turn it off, right? Um, and I know that I can't because sometimes it'll be nine at night and I don't have I don't care about TV. I, I may just be on the computer doing some research. Right. Looking up uh, whatever it is. But how do you handle like the hustle of, you know, entrepreneurship and not turning it off? Do you believe in uh, work life balance? Do you believe in kind of like balancing things if you can't turn it off? Like how do you handle that and how do you feel about that? I don't understand why you'd want to turn it off. Mm, mm. I think that the rest of the world convinces us we should. Uh -huh. And to that I say, fuck off. Right. right because right. we have a gift. Uh -huh. We have a gift that if we can manage who we are uh -huh. and we can keep on the hunt, we don't have to turn it off. And I do believe that we should sleep and we should take care of ourselves and you should treat yourself like a professional athlete because you're an evolutionary hunter. You should look like one. Right. When I see somebody like us who doesn't look like an athlete, I wonder why. I'm like, dude, we are physiologically sensitive, momentum-based beings that are highly reactive to constraint. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we see the world like everybody else does. So I think understanding what we really want is the most important thing. Let me share it with you, Isaiah. Okay. So, so see, I don't think... And, and you're going to you're going to think for a second here. This guy's crazy if you haven't already. But I don't no, think no, I that, like you. I like you. I like, <laughs> I, like I, I like what you're talking about. I keep talking. So so I don't think that people like you and I really understand the difference between happy and sad. Mm -hmm. Now, here, here's what I mean. We figured out that happy and sad are binary, like happy's on, sad's off, and you know those are emotions that everybody else feels. But the fact is, do we really know what those mean Like as people like us? Because what's the difference between sad, pissed off, frustrated, confused, ticked off, and I'm just plain not going to talk to you? Is there any difference? Mm, uh, no. Doesn't what? that shit confuse you? Yeah, because I think that there's a meaning that's given to it, but there is no real concrete definition of each one and and when somebody says isaiah how are you feeling mm -hmm. how does it make you feel i don't i don't know like, right i don't know how i mean i know how i feel but i can't put it into a definition well let me help you 
Because see, the problem for people like us is that we don't live in that magical world of feelings and unless we're watching a Disney movie. Uh-huh. The rest of the world is hardwired to find happy, sad, frustrated, elated, confused, all this shit. But the fact is we have three different ways of existing in the world. Mm-hmm. Entrepreneurial personality types, evolutionary hunters are hardwired to be in momentum. Mm. Isaiah, when I say that word momentum, do you hear it or do you feel it or both? I definitely know exactly what you mean. I feel it because uh, that's very important because momentum is how I think that's success. Yeah. Because you start something and then you see how the momentum can happen and that's what drives you because that drives that success. See, you're getting it, man. You know? So so when you're in momentum, tell me how it feels. Oh, like I mean, things are going your way when you're, you're when you're getting things done, when you're in momentum, when you're on the hunt, when you're killing shit. Like, what does it feel like to you? I mean, it, it honestly I can honestly say it is one of the best feelings because you don't you, it's like your tunnel vision. Yeah. You know, it, for just example, like a hunter. If I wake up, if I wake up at four thirty, I go to the gym by five, I get home by six thirty. You know, I, I eat, I take a shower and I'm doing some work. By 12, I've gotten accomplished a whole – I'm feeling amazing. You've accomplished more than most people will all week because you're an evolutionary hunter. Right. And we live for momentum. And here's the fact. When I ask people what does being in momentum feel like, 100% of evolutionary hunters will say things like it feels like ecstasy. It feels like um, – it feels like you, – you know, it feels great. It feels incredible. It feels like sex. It feels like being high. But then sooner or later, somebody says, Alex, doesn't it just feel like being alive? Mm. Because for evolutionary hunters, being in momentum on the hunt is how we stay alive. So when somebody says, do you believe in balance? Here's what I think about balance. I think of a tightrope and one of us falling off. Because you can't balance our drive for momentum with what the rest of the world tells us we should have. Right. Right. Our drive for momentum is way too overpowering. It's the single biggest drive in our lives. And, and here's how I know. The second state, so first state is in momentum. We don't know happy, sad, frustrated, all those things. First state is momentum. That's where evolutionary hunters live. Because if you're on the hunt and somebody gets injured, you can't stop to cry about them. You just have to go hunt. We don't feel the same feelings as everybody else. And I'm willing to bet you've been told your whole life you don't feel right. People have said stuff like, Isaiah, why are you so excited? Why don't you get less excited? Why don't you slow down? Why don't you talk slower? You're making everyone else uncomfortable. Why are you being so loud? Why are you being so quiet? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm just living with passion. But, but, just, you, but right. everybody, how, how many times has your confusion been mistaken for anger? Yes. How yes. many times has your frustration been seen as an attack? Yes. Or, or, or my passion is mistaken for anger or yelling. Yep. You know, I've been so. Why are you yelling? I'm not yelling. I'm, this I'm, is, I'm this is what I'm, I'm so excited about. Yeah. Right? I'm not mad. I'm frustrated at the fact that this can be done this way or this can happen so much faster. Yep. That's what I'm frustrated about that I am working with or I'm around someone who doesn't see life the same way that I see it. So that's, that's, why what, I, that's why hunters need their tribe, brother. Right. That's deep. But how do you feel about how do you feel about isolation? In? Because um, I think that I think that as an entrepreneur, it's important to be around like minded people. But it's also important from my perspective to be, you know, by yourself at some point in time. So, you know, you said that's why they need, you know, a tribe. But like, how do you feel about the isolation versus being around like minded and talk about like like. You know, what what point in time in life it's good to kind of be alone and be around people? I think that for people like us, when we isolate for too long is when we really get in trouble. You know, we, we are incredible at going in and going deep and doing research and figuring things out and understanding things and accomplishing on our own. But as evolutionary hunters, we are hardwired to need our tribe. And when we isolate, when we're alone, when we don't communicate with other people, that's when we go down evolutionary loops and spirals that keep us held in place. In fact, it's the second state of momentum. It's, it's when you're facing resistance. Mm. And you've probably been through this, Isaiah. It's like when the world is come against you, the cards are stacked against you, you don't have enough resources, don't have enough time, don't have enough money, but you're facing resistance and there's that small light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> that and you everyone continue else, to make up. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? And everyone else is like, dude, it's a train. Get out of the tunnel. Right. And you're like, screw it. I'm going to do it anyway. You go after that light. And what happens when we're facing resistance? We create momentum anyway. Right. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right, right, right. right now, right. there's a third state. Now, this is what we have to be careful with. This is where things get sketchy for people like us. It's when we're in constraint. Okay. It's when the situation around us mm -hmm. or the system around us or the authority around us holds us in place. When we can't move forward, when we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, when we don't know our next move and we are in constraint. Do you know what I'm talking about? 100%. So when you're in that feeling, do you remember like when you're in momentum, do you, do you know that you can do more when you're in momentum? Like is, is that a reality for you? 100%. You have because way more you're already standard, moving. Right. right. When you're in momentum, are you cognitively smarter? Like, can you think faster, make decisions quicker, do the right thing faster? It's like a magic. It's like a superpower. Hell yeah. And when you're in momentum, here's the big one. Are you chemically boosted? Do you actually feel the chemical high of momentum? It's like an endorphin. No doubt. Right. So here's the problem. When we get in constraint, immediately our bodies start to break down. People like us, evolutionary hunters, we are meant to be moving. We are physiologically sensitive, momentum-based beings. Shit, you're up before the sun comes up to go work out. I do the same thing because I have to, not because I want to. That's because I know that's how I get the most out of who I am. The second thing that happens when we're in constraint is cognitively, we have trouble making decisions. We have trouble seeing the next move. We have trouble understanding what we should do next. And here's the big one, Isaiah. When we're in constraint, we're affected chemically. Mm-hmm. So evolutionary hunters, entrepreneurial personality types like you and I, when we get into that place of constraint, you know what happens? We get diagnosed with depression, with bipolar, with ADD, with ADHD, with Asperger's, with all this other shit. And the fact is, all it is, is the rest of the world labeling the people that make them uncomfortable when they're uncomfortable. Mm. Mm. Because here's what's interesting. You take a kid, a little evolutionary hunter today, a kid like you and I, who, by the way, today is screwed in a public school 100%. because at seven years old, if that kid wiggles around and moves, you know, by, I couldn't sit in a chair for six hours today listening to somebody talk about something I didn't care about, but we expect a seven year old to do it. Right. And today, because he can't sit in class, they're saying, give him a medication. And the fact is that we are, have always been like this. We can't sit still. We have to move. We want to create. We want to do more. We want to make things happen. And so when we're in constraint, that's when we break down and that's when we get diagnosed. And the challenge today is most of the systems in the world not only don't work for people like you and I, they break us down. Dang. So it's like a double negative. No doubt, man. That's why we have to protect ourselves from right. the people and the systems out there. Right. Because the fact is, most of the things are created for people who live in the present. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. when you're like us and you're constantly creating a new future, it's a totally different lens through which you observe the world. A hundred percent. And it's funny that you say that because I was in the military, so I know all about the constraint that you're talking about. No right? doubt. Right? So, I'm going to speak at Fort Hood next week. Oh, are you? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I do a lot of work with the military. I actually went, um, I've spoken several times at a bunch of bases here uh -huh. in the U.S., and then uh, I went to the Pentagon and okay. went through a joint chiefs meeting with uh -huh. all four branches of the military. <laughs> Dude, talk about freaking constraint. Right. <laughs> Longest right. meeting of my life. Yes. So how do you, um, how, how do you, what message do you deliver to them, and how do you deliver that? Well, I think most people in the military are just like me, um. you know? When uh, when you look at why somebody goes in the military, they're usually running away from something or running towards something. Right. And it takes a special type of person to go into the military. And every time that I've sat down with somebody in leadership or somebody in special forces or even just an infantry guy and we start talking like this, they are just like I am. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the military looked better than a corporation or the military looked better than the other options. And there is some of the most incredible leaders, some of the most intense entrepreneurs and some of the most amazing athletes in the military. A hundred percent. And uh, so I go and we talk about who they are uh -huh. and we unleash their inner entrepreneur and, and I and I show them something. And here's 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 like the the summary of my work is that. When I was a kid, mm -hmm. I was so different than everybody else. Um, when adults saw me coming, they used to say like, hey, look, there's Jennifer and Isaiah and Alex. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And 
I knew they were doing that. Right. And so I went and started studying successful people and I obsessively read as much as I could get my hands on of what this thing called success was. And here's what I found. When you read thousands of biographies of successful people, here's what you see. They are all different and broken and disordered and disabled and they didn't have enough and they didn't have what it took. Helen Keller couldn't talk or speak. Mother Teresa was totally like – she, she should not have been able to do what she did. Martin Luther King had everything stacked against him and he still changed the fucking world. Right. And so when you're a kid and you don't show up like everyone else, talk like everyone else, breathe like everyone else, and you know, learn at the same time as everyone else, they say you're a broken person that needs to be medicated and corrected. Mm-hmm. And the fact is history shows when you don't talk like everyone else – show up like everyone else, act like everyone else, that's a brilliant person that's going to change the world. Right. And so for, for you and for everyone listening, here's what I want you to understand. Like the, the, the summary of my research is this, that if you've ever felt different or isolated or alone or like a party of one or made to feel less than because of who you are, then congratulations. Because the very fact that you have gone through those feelings indicates to me with 100% certainty that you're part of the most important club in history. Mm -hmm. Because right now, if you call up the timeline of history that you remember, and you think of anyone who matters to be remembered, anyone that you remember that matters to you, I remember who it was for me. You know, I read of Aristotle and Socrates who who had attitudes so bad nobody wanted to be around him. I read of Einstein who didn't talk until he was four and couldn't tie his shoes. I related to that. You know, Pythagoras who who changed mathematics for the world and they killed him for it. Newton who sat under a tree because he was so antisocial, then an apple hit him in the head and he discovered gravity. People like us have always been different. Picasso's blue period was a period in art history, but today it would have been called a period of depression for one person. See? And the fact is that for anyone on this call or broadcast or podcast <laughs> who's ever felt different, uh-huh. here's what I want you to know. You're part of the most important club in history because entrepreneurs, the people who see the world different, are the only source of consistent positive human evolution and we always will be. And you are are one of the most important people in the world. And if your mind is pregnant with the question, can I do more, can I be more, should I do more, can I make a bigger contribution, the answer is fuck yes, because you're asking it. Right. And don't let anyone ever tell you different. Right, right. Man, look, Alex, we're going to have to do a part two. <laughs> I'm totally in, man. <laughs> we're going to have to do a part two. How can people find, find, find out about you and uh, find you on social media and the web and stuff? So if you go to Facebook, you can join my group called The Optimized Entrepreneur. Uh I think every evolutionary hunter should optimize their entire life, and that's Uh a free group you can join. Uh And then if you go on um, iTunes or Google or Stitcher, search for The Entrepreneurial Personality Type, my Momentum podcast. Uh And uh, it's a podcast where I take people through the details of The Entrepreneurial Personality Type because here's what I want every one of us to do. I want entrepreneurs to understand themselves better, stop limiting behaviors, and create massive momentum because the balance of power in the world has swung to the coordinators and the communicators and the caretakers who do not like people like us. Mm -hmm. And we are entering one of two things, either the dark ages where nothing will be created because every one of us is going to be medicated and shut down by red tape and regulations, or we're entering the age of entrepreneurial enlightenment. And I want every person who's listening to know that not only can you build a team and build a company, you can build a team and grow an empire because that's what people like us have done throughout history to insulate ourselves from the rest of the world. And you must because you owe it to your tribe. Mm -hmm. We all go faster together Mm -hmm. and we all go forward farther when we work together. Mm. I love that, man. Like, seriously, Um, (laughs) man, I love that so much. And everybody listening. This is what we be talking about. Chase your dreams, man. Go do what you want to do with your life. There's no reason to be doing anything that you just don't want to be doing. I don't care what it is. There's no excuse. You just have to figure it out. You know, I had to figure it out. I had to take risks. I had to jump off the cliff. And you have to, too, if you're sitting somewhere where you don't want to be. So um, I thank you so much, Alex, for your time. Um, we're going to be in touch. and Let's do, do part another, two. Do another episode because... We have a lot more to talk about. You got it, brother. <laughs> so Thanks for having said, me. Yeah, no problem. Um, go to go to your podcast 
And with that being said, we're going to talk to you guys on the next episode. Do you have anything else you want to say? I just want to tell everyone there is nothing wrong with you and you are not alone. That's it, man. Final words. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening to the Starts With The Vision podcast. Come get your vision clear at www.startswiththevision.com. See you there.